We're going to touch on quite a few different topics tonight. Um, we've got a lot of information to get through and it's going to be really fun and exciting. So without further ado, this is Megan. Let's get started. Yeah, obviously I'm one of the psychologists here at City Cave. Um, I'm currently in private practice, so I work, um, used to work across the lifespan, but at the moment I predominantly just work with adults as well as couples. Um, so today my main objective is to mainly look at communication patterns, um, uh, essentially giving you conflict resolution skills. So we all have fights, you know, at any point in our relationship, help you to understand what might be causing your fights, predominantly what's happening in your brain when you are engaged in a conflict um, and then definitely give you some tools about how to manage that dynamic um, and hopefully reduce the, the amount of fights that you are having at present um, and then we'll move to more about connection seeking just at the end so how to rebuild connection back with your partner um, and even if you feel like you're quite connected um, we talk about the role of connection in maintaining the longevity of your relationship. So that's pretty much it. So <clears throat> to jump into it, what I'd like you guys to do is all think of the last time you had a fight that didn't go well. So um, we've all had one of those that we can pop up in our head and we can maybe feel quite embarrassed about the way it escalated or the point it got to. And what I want you to think about is not the content of the fight, so that doesn't matter, but try and think about the way you acted in that fight and the way your partner acted in that fight. So when we look at unhelpful conflict, essentially we can identify quite common themes for all of us and that is often I'm sure you can recognise that you were incredibly reactive. So you were saying things maybe that you wouldn't say in a calm space, um, perhaps really hurtful things, name calling, um, you might also identify some unhelpful behaviours, so things like shutting down, walking away, um, stonewalling is what we call it in psychology. So, what I want you to do is have some of those behaviours in mind as we move through this discussion um, and see if you can pinpoint what was happening for you in that moment as I explained the um, process in your brain that kind of led to those that escalation. Um, so what we're going to do is, like I said, we're going to move through the brain in um, understanding that process and then helping you to identify how you can shift it moving forward. So, You've all got an outline of a brain there and it's actually really helpful to draw it as I talk because um, you obviously absorb it a bit more and we can all shut down a bit when we start to talk about like parts of the brain. So don't worry, we're making it really simple and just applicable for you. So yeah, see if you can just draw along with me. Does yep. everybody have a brain? <laughs> as in like, on the <laughs> Everyone's got a brain, but does everyone have a piece yeah. of paper? Yeah, everyone's got their handouts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when we look back at that moment that you might recognise you were um, really incredibly reactive, John Gottman, who is a renowned psychologist for couples counselling, and mostly everything I refer to today comes from his work. You've also got a number of articles there from his institute, so Gottman Institute. So um, moving forward, if you need further resources, that's your go-to. Um, I'll also hand out his book at the end and we'll watch a couple of his videos um, so you feel like you've left with a couple of resources. But essentially, John Gottman refers to this process as emotional flooding, so emotional hijacking. So what we want to understand is what really causes us to flood with emotions in that time when, when we're triggered from our partner. So basic understanding of the brain, this is where you get drawing everyone, is down here at the bottom part of your brain is what we call the limbic system, right? So this is your survival part of your brain. So over here is, so you can write limbic. And essentially your limbic system is that primitive part of your brain that's responsible for keeping you safe. So when we understand the limbic system, it takes in all sensory information um, and it perceives threats in your environment. So in your limbic system is your little friend called the amygdala. And what your amygdala does is your threat detection system. So it's always scanning the environment, looking for threats to your system. Um, what happens is when no, we don't want to go there yet, sorry. But essentially, this is the main culprit for conflict. 
so is your limbic system. We're going to come back to the limbic system and what targets that threat detection system, but we'll move up to the front here, and this is called your frontal cortex. So your frontal cortex is your thinking brain, so that sits up here, so your limbic system is down the bottom. Oh, sorry, and I didn't say your limbic system is where all your emotions come from, so that's your emotion-based responses all comes from the bottom part of the brain. If we come back, sorry, to the frontal cortex, that's your thinking brain. So that's responsible for reductions, deductions, thinking, problem solving, analyzing, all that great stuff that, you know, a primitive animal doesn't have. Um, when we think about conflict and we apply it to couples counseling, this is actually going to be a crucial part of resolving your conflict. So we can say it down here as your culprit, and this is pretty much your crucial friend in moving forward. So now let's understand what happens in your brain when we engage in conflict with our partner. So your limbic system, I'm sure you've all heard of the fight, flight, freeze response, so the three Fs. What I want you to think about now is that that part of, um, that response comes from the bottom part of your brain. So your amygdala will perceive a threat and that can happen in a conflict in your partner might just say one thing that triggers you. So we all have certain triggers and whatever that is for each of us, that's a so helpful thing to start to understand what your triggers are and that happens more in individual therapy or couples based therapy. But your partner triggers you and all of a sudden you get this flood, this overwhelming response to whatever they've said and that's come from the bottom part of your brain. So your amygdala has perceived that as a threat. So it kicks you into your automatic survival mode. So that fight, flight, or freeze. This is what I want you to think about for a second, is what is each of your own um, automatic response when you're threatened? So there's those three ones, right? One of you, you might fight. So you might stand your ground, you might argue, you want them to hear your point, you're committed to it, you'll go, you know, till the sun rises, you will argue until that person hears what you have to say. Or do you have more of a flight-based response? So you tend to walk away, turn away from your partner, we call it stonewalling, you shut the conversation down, you don't want to borrow it. That might be your automatic response. Or the other one might be free, so you just withdraw in and you're frozen. You actually have nothing to say, you can't really move, you feel overwhelmed by the situation. So I want each of you to identify which one of those tends to be your automatic go-to and write that down. And then see what your partner's automatic go-to is. <laughs> and if your partner's not here, or you're not in a relationship at present, you might think of past relationships or you might identify it it's just in your interactions. So you might think, oh no, they definitely fight. No, they fly, they freeze. Okay, so what's happening then is when this whole system is engaged, so we're, we identify we either fight, flight, or freeze, there's actually an interaction between this part of the brain and the thinking part of our brain. And we can essentially say that the thinking part of our brain shuts down. So this is a you know primitive-based response. When we're in danger, our body teaches us how to just react without thinking, right? We just quick, we make snap decisions. And that's happening in a conflict with our partner. So our frontal cortex goes offline. We cannot access the logical part of our brain. So everything we're saying, everything we're doing is purely an emotion-based response. So you can kind of see now why you say the things that you did in that moment, why you did those things, and why they were not rational. And when you're out of it, you go, geez, that was a bit much. <laughs> Does that make sense so far? So now, what's happening is when we apply it to couples conflict, you can see that when one of us gets triggered, so we're born, we're in the bottom part of our brain, so we're emotionally flooded, that's that term again. We get emotionally flooded, fight, fight, or freeze. When we're in that space, we're saying stuff that's incredibly unhelpful, and we often trigger our partner because of what we're saying. So now you can imagine the exact same response has happened in your partner's brain, and you have two people in a room who are both emotionally flooded, who cannot access the thinking part of their brain. And so it just keeps escalating. 
And so you can see why it can get to a point that's maybe even unsafe, or it gets to a point where it can feel almost like you've done something severe enough that you can't come back from. And that's because you have two people who are essentially out of control. And they'll just keep, you'll just keep escalating. So how do we apply this to conflict resolution is we need to give you a few techniques to one, recognize that this has happened for you, so that's just understanding this process. So start to use the terms emotionally flooded in your dialogue with your partner. So that can be, wow, I just recognized I've become emotionally flooded. Or, wow, I'm, I'm wondering perhaps are you feeling emotionally flooded. <laughs> it might feel a bit weird at the beginning or um, it might feel condescending and it's obviously the way that you do it and they're like, oh my gosh, you're so emotionally flooded right now, that's not helpful. <laughs> It's doing it in a way that's meant to, one, bring awareness into this space, right? So when we're here, we don't know that we're not accessing our thinking brain. We're just going for it. But the minute we go, geez, I actually can't access this part of my brain, the part of my brain I need to resolve a conflict, you'll then know what your next steps are. And maybe you do that together. Wow, I recognize we're both flooded right now. So what do we do next? So that's your first step. Um, moving forward, you then need to um, learn how to control and change that system up. So when you're triggered, you're flooded, you're in the threat, well, look, sorry, survival part of your brain, you then need to somehow calm your brain down enough to access your thinking brain again, right? So we need to learn how to get rid of that barrier and get our thinking brain back online. And why is that important? So when we look at the frontal cortex, there's three main components of the frontal cortex that are key to conflict resolution. So you've got your working brain. Men tend to do working brain better. So they tend to sit here a lot more. So they do, they problem solve, they want to fix, come up with solutions, fix problems. Women actually sit down here with a lot more ease. So sit in that emotion-based responses with a lot ease. And that sometimes is also the conflict. Um, and we'll get back to that as another tip for resolving it. Um, so your working brain helps you to come up with solutions. So if you've identified a problem and you together need to you know, move forward on how you can change that, you need that part of your brain. You also, it comprises of your noticing brain. So your noticing brain actually calms your limbic system. So that's that ability to go, wow, I'm flooded. And the other part is it's actually comprises of your soothing brain. So your soothing brain is obviously that ability to down-regulate, calm yourself down, recognize that you're wound up, and then engage a strategy of some sort to soothe. This is also really important is that how you soothe depends on how you were parented. So in a healthy relationship, you need an ability to both co-soothe and self-soothe. So self-soothe means, okay, I'm going to take some time out, I'm just going to go to the next room and, you know, we'll, we'll come back to this later. In that space, you do a bit of breathing, you maybe use a bit of mindfulness, distract yourself for a bit, whatever that looks like. So that's self-soothing, you're regulating your own system. Co-soothing is you actually go towards your partner and you seek them to support you to calm down. So maybe that's physical contact, um, they give you reassuring words, they talk to the emotion part of your brain. Depending on how we were parented, some of us can chronically self-soothe or chronically co-soothe. And that's really important as well to identify. And if that's different across both of you. So you know, depending on your parenting and how your parents raised you, they might have told you that it was inappropriate to soothe with another person. They, would have, they might have told you, do it on your own, don't be a soup, don't be a baby, get on out there. That's chronically self-soothing. So you never go towards your partner to seek out that reassurance. The chronic co-soothing would be that you only can have another person to down-regulate your system. So that could have been like a parent who maybe had an anxious disposition. Every time you cried, they would have hovered over you, grouped you up, said, it's okay, it's okay, we'll be all right, everything's fine. But then you don't learn those skills, ability to self-regulate. So we need a balance of both. And if you recognize you and your partner do one or the other only, you need to learn techniques, and that's mainly also in individual therapy of how to sit okay in the other one, and how to have a balance of both. Does that make sense, the soothing element? 
Yeah. Any questions so far? Does um like taking stimulants like pre workout and coffee and stuff, does that affect your blood? Yeah. And yeah. then that we should want to just say to them more Spot on, yeah, great point, yeah. So you're so we have to be having more of the fights to do that stuff and Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So if you think about it, your amygdala is your like smoke detector, so it detects when there's a fire. If you have certain factors that make that more sensitive, so like any anxiety disorder, um, stimulants, all of those things, it means you're more likely to detect threats more often. So it's more likely to shoot you into this response quicker. It might be oversensitive. So essentially what we, uh, the analogy they use is, it's like a smoke detector that detects fire from a toaster versus fire, smoke, oh my goodness, detects smoke from a toaster versus smoke from a fire. So that means that, yeah, you can recognize the interplay of those kind of factors. Um, and it also means that you need to be working really hard to downregulate your system more often on your own. Yeah, so self-care techniques, relaxation techniques, um, to prevent the likelihood of conflict. Yeah. yeah, it's a great point. Thanks. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. And that once again comes back to learning skills to self-regulate. Yeah. So we all substances like say alcohol, coffee, anything? Um, yeah, well alcohol inhibi um, inhibits your ability to downregulate your own system, right? So when you're intoxicated, obviously that's why a lot of fights happen when we're drunk. You know, you can identify a lot more of your fights with your partner can happen in that space. So yeah, because you actually have an inability to access this top part of your brain. That's just happening on a biological level. But it also means you have an inability to use this part. So you can't really recognize that you're flooded. Because of the, yeah, all of Yeah. Okay, all good so far? Okay, so what's, where that leads us is you need to be able to access these three parts of your brain to solve your conflict moving forward. So, my, of course I said my first step is to say, introduce the word flooding into your relationship, identify it for yourself, learn what your triggers are, what, what are your cues that you're flooded, look for physical signs in your body, you know, obviously racing parts, um, feeling shaky, of course, things you're saying might not be logical, that's a great sign that you're flooded. Um, the second part is, um, oh yes, is to actually prevent escalation, is to introduce questions into the beginning of your conflict. So if you think about, instead of saying just statements, asking your partner questions means they keep having to use the top part of their brain, so they can't sit just in the bottom part. So if you keep asking questions at the beginning rather than blank statements, you're more likely to either of you prevent flooding to begin with. However, this is a really important point, do not ask questions if you are flooded. So if you are flooded, you're in the bottom part of your brain. If you ask a question, they will become more agitated <laughs> because they can't access that part of their brain. So it's almost like you're, you're pretty much saying to them, do something you have no control over right now. So they'll increase their frustration and you'll continue to escalate. So you need to become really good at knowing when's the right time to use questions and when it isn't. When you're flooded, when you're both flooded especially, that's when you need to take time out. So that's, that. I'm, you know, I've heard from a few couples in my individual work with them, time out doesn't work, we just come back, we start fighting again, or one person is left upset. So timeout, essentially what Gottman calls it, is a healthy exit. And healthy exits have a few different points that make them different to just stonewalling. So stonewalling is, I'm done, whatever, shut up, don't want to talk about it, I'm sick of this conversation, I'm not talking to you anymore. Of course that's not helpful. Healthy exit is, I hear what's happening for you, I recognize that you're upset, so you talk to the emotion part of their brain, because that's where they're sitting, but right now, I need to leave. And you make a commitment of when you come back. And that's the key part of a healthy exit, is if you can say that I'm committing to coming back, and you might even make a time, sometimes I get quite a strong sense of security, that's when that other person won't react with the same response. 
because often stonewalling triggers another person. So you know, if, if your automatic response is fight and your partner's automatic response is flight, the minute they flight, you're like, whoa, that's it, I'm going. And then you will kind of walk after them. My husband knows I did that one. <laughs> so, so that's why a healthy exit is different in that you essentially have to commit to a time that you'll do it again you acknowledge what's happening from the person and you also show them it's separate from just shutting the conversation down. So why is a healthy exit really helpful for this? Well, of course, because you downregulate. So you leave, you have space out, you're not being triggered anymore. You learn how to downregulate. So like I said, you need to learn skills like that. So whether that's breathing um, or even you just learn how to problem solve for yourself in that moment. The minute you downregulate, so you essentially tell your brain, I'm okay, we're fine, we're, there's not a threat anymore, bing, your thinking brain comes back online. So that's constant interplay between your survival brain and your thinking brain. They're always at kind of odds of each other. So you need to recognize, am I my thinking brain, my survival brain? Well, survival brain, okay, let me time out, go back to thinking brain. Make sense? Yeah. So those are my main tips in terms of how to resolve it. Um, and definitely talking, I said, I've been saying it a few times, but I didn't really explain it. Talking to the emotion center of your partner's brain is incredibly helpful. So when you're both in the, the um, yeah, limbic system, if you can use words like, I can see you're really upset. So you don't agree with the statement that they're saying, but you validate the emotion that they're expressing. So I can see you're really upset. I can see you're really angry right now. Um, I can hear that you're really worried. That calms this whole system down. So if just your partner's flooded and you aren't, and you want to teach each other how to co-regulate, so co-soothe, if you can say, name a feeling, identify it for them, speak just at the feeling, the whole brain calms down and your partner will access thinking brain, and then you can have a proper conversation with them in that one. Does that make sense? So I'll play a quick video of some four unhelpful communication styles that happen with Thanks, Jeremy. Um, once again, this is from Gottman. So this book, um, I'll pass it around. It's a really great book. It says marriage, but obviously if you're not married, it doesn't matter. Um, it's mainly about techniques for conflict resolution. Um, he's incredibly helpful, like I'm not just saying that, but a lot of his resources are spot on. So he talks about some of these um, patterns that we identify in communication. So if anyone wants to, I'll pass around to you and take a photo if you want to buy it. Um, so I'll quickly watch this. They're so selfish. <laughs> oh, it's not my fault we're always late. Forget it. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewall. Dr. John Gottman calls these negative communication patterns the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they'll lead to the end of your relationship. In fact, he can predict this relationship failure with over 90% accuracy if the behavior isn't changed. So, what can you do? Well, at the Gottman Institute, we understand you might not even know you're communicating this way, or you might not know how to control it. But if you practice the following four research-based antidotes, there is hope for your future. Criticism attacks the character of the recipient instead of focusing on a specific behavior. The antidote to criticism is to talk about your feelings using I statements that express a positive meaning. Contempt is an expression of superiority that comes out as sarcasm, cynicism, name calling, eye rolling, sneering, mockery, and hostile humor. Contempt is the greatest predictor of relationship failure and must be eliminated. The antidote to contempt is to treat one another with respect and build a culture of appreciation within a relationship. Defensiveness is self-protection through righteous indignation or fighting the victim. Defensiveness never solves a problem and is really just an underhanded way of blaming your partner. The antidote to defensiveness is to accept responsibility, even if only for part of the conflict. Analyze their behavior over an extended period. He talks about it in that book. His research is incredible in that, yeah, it pretty much has He's been able to predict such to such a oh my word, I can't think of the term. Anyway, he can predict um, what really were the factors that led to couples that were getting divorced or not. And emotional connection was the key. 
So when we're looking at your relationship, how to make it thrive and move forward, the longevity of it, you need to be honing in on emotional connection. We always think it's just conflict, you know, if we're fighting, but we can fight better, we can resolve it quicker, everything will be great. It's not, it's about connection. So when we look at connection, um, there's a few things and essentially it comes down to attachment. So your attachment is obviously the dynamic you had with your parents when you were growing up and your attachment actually predicts how well developed your thinking brain is. So how well developed you are at thinking, problem solving, analyzing, deducting, rationalizing, all depends on how you were parented and the attachment you had with your parents. That's a whole different ball game that we could have a bit of another workshop on. So if you want to understand your attachment style, you want to understand your attachment style within a relationship, see a couples counselor, because that's quite a heavy topic. Um, but understanding that two people likely have different attachment styles. So understanding how those two things interact is incredibly important as well, because attachment also predicts your ability to connect with somebody else. So to connect with a partner and to connect in a way that's actually incredibly healthy. So we can connect in unhealthy ways. So we can be, you know, interdependent, codependent, that comes back to that. You need someone else to be okay. That's not a healthy attachment. So when we're looking, we're going to move a bit away from attachment, but when we look at attachment in adult couples relationships, we say that there's three main questions that you're asking of your partner to feel emotionally connected. So this comes from Sue Johnson, which is another really great psychologist to look at. Um, this is her, it's meant to be a book, I by mistake ordered the audio of it. So <laughs> no one even has CD players anymore. But um, this is her other book if you want to also take a picture of it. So called Hold Me Tightly, it's incredibly, incredibly great. And she has a lot of awesome videos. She's a bit weird, but she's really good. So if you want another one around attachment and connection, that's a good one. I'll just put it there and write down the title. So she says that there's three main questions we ask of our partners. So you can remember it by, are you there? So the R stands for these three main points. So A stands for accessibility. Essentially, you're asking your partner, can I reach you? Do I matter? Responsiveness is the R. Can I depend on you? Will you come to me when I call? E is engagement. Are you emotionally present? Do you share? Will you keep me close? Do you hear me repeat any of those? Yeah, repeat them again. Okay, so A is accessibility. The question you're asking of your partner is, can I reach you? Do I matter? Responsiveness, can I depend on you? Will you come to me when I call? Engagement, are you emotionally present? Do you share? Will you keep me close? When we understand those questions, they're very similar to a child-parent dynamic, aren't they? So you can understand it's about when we were children, we wanted to know that we mattered to our parents, that they were available when we needed them, so that was that accessibility. We wanted to know that we could depend on them, they would be there, they were responsive to whatever emotion we showed, whether it was positive or not. We also needed to know that they would come when we sought them out. When we were children, we also needed to make sure that our parents spoke to us just emotionally, it wasn't just rules and boundaries. And we needed to know that they would you know, be there to protect us, they close, we had that physical component of our relationship with our parents. It's exactly the same with our adults. We're seeking the same core basis from that same attachment, to feel connected, to feel safe, to feel secure. When we have those needs met, so if you can answer that your partner meets these needs, not all the time, of course, but if they most of the time meet those needs, you're doing well we've got quite a secure attachment. Okay. So when we look at attachment beyond, thanks. When we look at connection, sorry, beyond just attachment, because like I said, go into your styles of attachment. You can even do a bit of research. Um, you can ask me and send out a few things. Um, or seek to establish it a bit more in therapy. But we look at bids for connection. So that's one of the main techniques that I give couples to improve your emotional connection moving forward. So bids to connection is another term from Gottman. 
he essentially says that throughout a relationship, we're continuously placing our bids to our partner to connect with them. So connection is the core of your whole relationship. And we, and whether relationship is thriving or not depends on whether our partner is really good at receiving our bids to connect or not. So bid to connect is we don't essentially as humans walk up to our partner and say, hey, I need you, I need your attention, I need a bit of support. We're not good like that. But we place out these little bids hoping to get the same need met. So essentially a bid to connect, a good example is like you're both lying in bed, you're both on your phone, you're absorbed in Instagram, whatever, and you're both not connected at all, right? You can identify, there's no way you're in each other's world in any way. But your partner turns to you, shows you your phone and goes, oh my gosh, this is hilarious. And you're just like, oh. You completely rejected their bid to connect. So it seems silly, it seems trivial, but that was a bid to bring you into their world. So how that your partner is left feeling is rejection. So these really small bits to connection happen all the time. It can be a smile or a wink. It can be, what did you eat for lunch today? It can be, um, you know, oh, I just saw this really funny video. Let me show you it. We think they're trivial. They don't matter. They're just these silly things I find it's just consuming space and time with. But they're bids to bring you into their world. So the better you get at recognizing your partner's bits and the better you get at responding to them will it absolutely increase your emotional connection because we think emotional connection is just like deep and meaningful conversations all the time but it's not so Gottman says that you can do three main things when your partner puts out a bid to connect one you can turn towards so that can even just be your body language that can be like a you know it doesn't always have to be like this huge conversation you can just be turning towards your partner laughing acknowledging something as small as that. You can turn away, so obviously directly saying, mm, doesn't matter, you don't accept the bit at all, you don't, you don't engage in any way. He actually says one of the worst ways that we can respond to a bid to connection is to miss it. So rejecting a bid still provides an opportunity to repair. So if we get at least a response, we can still do something with that. If you just miss your partner's bids altogether, is actually one of the most detrimental things you can do for your relationship. So he says that lack of emotional connection is most often due to mindlessness. Absorbed in your own world, doing your own thing, working a lot, social media, watching TV, just complete mindlessness. It's not you know, on purpose rejecting your partner, saying hurtful things. He says it's just a lack of engagement. And that is the most common cause nowadays for marriage breakdown. Part of the relationship right now. Thoughts? Questions? <laughs> <Same time. laughs> <Same time. laughs> I think we can all relate. So yeah, your homework. Um, I'm sure you didn't think you were going to get some homework. So you've also got to have out on bits to connection. A few more examples. Um, a few ways that you can look for the message behind the bits. So that's important to recognize. Your partner might be saying, "Oh, look at this funny video." Think of what's the message under that. What is your partner trying to do? They're probably trying to enjoy a moment with you, find something similar interest, look for the messages. Your homework is to look for bids to connect from your partner throughout the week and then acknowledge your way that you're responding. So if you can bring just awareness to bids, that's it. You will change your relationship dramatically in just by consciously observing your partner's bids and then you yourself and um, also taking an active effort to place bids out to your partner to bring them into your world. Sounds okay? <laughs> cool. So that's it. Um, oh yeah, no, I have one last video. <laughs> um, that um, covers that book, The Seven Principles to Making a Marriage Work, just quickly. Um, we'll watch that for seven minutes and then that's it. And then if you've got any questions, we'll just touch on them after that. But then that's <laughs> Enhance your love maps. Happy couples are familiar with each other's world. 
They have a love map of one another. They know all the details about their partner's life. Can you guys hear? They know each other's favorite TV show, yep. what their current goals are, and what stresses them out. Without a love map, you can't really know your spouse. And if you don't really know someone, how can you truly love them? To enhance their love maps, find out what you don't know about your partner by asking questions. Here are some examples. Who are your partner's best friends? Who are the relatives your partner likes the least? What is your partner's basic life philosophy? And are you familiar with your partner's hopes and aspirations? It can be easy to lose sight of your love maps amongst the events in life that require your attention such as work, family issues and other things. But for a healthy relationship, it is essential that you know each other's love maps. Principle 2. Nurture your fondness and admiration. This is perhaps the most important principle of all, so pay attention. To nurture your fondness and admiration for each other is to have a positive view of each other. A couple can find out their current level of fondness and admiration by seeing how they view their past. If they view it in a positive light, then they are likely to have a great future. If they view it in a negative light, then they are in trouble. To nurture your fondness and admiration, Dalton stresses that appreciation is essential. Write down three or more of your partner's positive characteristics along with an incident that illustrates each quality. Then read your list to each other. For example, if your partner did something as simple as doing the dishes instead of you, show your appreciation by thanking them for their kindness. The third principle is to turn toward each other instead of away. It's the little things that count. To be a happy couple, turn toward each other by showing them care. You can do this through small acts of giving your partner your free attention. Play board games together, shop for groceries, or call each other during the day. These small acts are the basis of connection and passion. When stress and conflict comes in the way of happy couples, they will have more positivity in what government calls their emotional bank accounts, which will help alleviate their conflicts. Principle 4. Let your partner influence you. Happy couples work as a team and consider each other's feelings and perspectives. They listen to each other and make decisions together by searching their common ground. Gottman identified that men are more likely than women to ignore their partner's perspective when tackling problems together. They exert too much power and must be open to being influenced by their partner's perspective if they are to improve their relationship. It's not always the men though, the same message applies to women as well. For example, if you want to spend $10,000 on a new car and your partner wants to spend it on a holiday, and take a deep breath and listen to each other. Show empathy, don't criticize, and really think about your partner's viewpoint. Principle 5. Solve your solvable problems. Gottman identifies two types of problems in relationships. Solvable problems and perpetual problems. It can be hard to tell the difference, but one way to tell is that solvable problems seem less intense and gut wrenching than perpetual ones. Solvable problems are situational and there's no underlying conflict. An example of a solvable problem is Bill and Sally agree that it's Bill's job to take out the trash every evening after dinner. Lately he's been distracted from work obligations and so he forgets. Sally ends up taking it out herself or the trash just sits there. In the morning the apartment smells horrible and so Sally is angry. This is a solvable problem. He's simply under a lot of stress at work and it has nothing to do with the underlying relationship issues. One possible solution is to put a sign on the fridge door as a reminder to take out the trash. Problem solved. Here are five steps to solve the solvable problem. Number one, soften your startup. When bringing back an issue, be calm, kind, and don't criticize. Number two, make and receive repair attempts. When the argument is getting out of hand, let your partner know and suggest they can break. 3. Soothe yourself and each other. On your break, go for a walk, listen to some music, read, or meditate. 4. Compromise. Share and consider each other's viewpoints to come up with a solution that works for both of you. 5. Be tolerant of each other's faults. If there are incidents in the past that come up in arguments, identify them, discuss them, and apologize when necessary. So what about perpetual problems? Well, here's an example of one. Susan wants to spend less time with Jim and more time with her friends. Jim says it makes him feel lonely. Susan says she needs time away from him. Jim seems needy to her and she's feeling suffocated by him. This is a perpetual problem. 
there is a core difference in their personalities and what they need from each other to feel connected. The difference is unlikely to change, so they will have to be willing to accept and adapt to it if they want their relationship to thrive. Principle 6. Overcome gridlock. Gridlock is the result of perpetual disagreements where both partners have entirely different beliefs, dreams, or personalities. Josie wants to have children, Harry doesn't. Ben wants Sally to go to church with him, but Sally is an atheist. Goldman claims these issues are unlikely to be solved, but you can learn to accept and adapt to your differences. Identify and respect each other's dreams and beliefs. You don't have to agree with them, but acknowledge, listen, and show respect to what your partner has to say. Come up with a temporary compromise and thank each other for sharing. The last principle is to create shared meaning. Shared meaning will enhance your marriage by bringing you together. Here are two ways you can create shared meaning. One, create rituals of connection. This could be anything that brings you together that you do on a regular basis, such as sharing a morning routine, celebrating Easter each year by going out as a family, or eating out together once a week. And number two, work towards a common goal, such as helping the community through volunteer work or building a houseboat. Now, you don't have to go building a houseboat, but it can be any goal that you both agree on that involves both of you. So that's that book. I'm um, summarised. Those are that second principles in a little summary. Um, so go through that book if you thought those resonated with you. Um, otherwise, I guess to finish it off, if there's a number of those that you feel like you needed a bit more information, you're not quite sure how to implement it, um, you identify maybe you don't feel you have those skills or that capacity just yet, that's where the therapist's role would come in. So you can learn those skills, you can shift patterns. Um, if you feel like there's more specifics around attachment and so forth, once again, just seek out um, some counselling support and we would 100% be able to sort that through with you. So if anyone's got questions, let me know. Um, I am, I do work out of City Cave on Wednesdays where, I, like I said, I do both individual and couples-based therapy. Um, and my car's out in front there if anyone needs to contact me. So any questions? Everyone okay with all of that? Awesome. Thanks for your, your time and listening, everyone.